Okay, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to this talk. Uh, my name is Jamie Dobson. I'm the CEO of Container Solutions, which is a company with offices in um, London, uh, Switzerland, and Amsterdam. So I'm going to be talking. Oops, I'm going to be talking today about cloud native strategy, lessons from literature. Now, quick sanity check: you're all in the right room. Yeah. Okay. Just check it. Usually, when I apply to technical conferences, the answer is no, or they put me in a tiny room in a very awkward time slot. So I don't usually have an audience quite like this. Um, we're going to be, I'm going to be doing some new stuff today, uh, a new talk, so fingers crossed I can uh, get a bit of feedback later during the Q&A. But what I want to do today, the key thing I want people to take away is I want them to be able to look at their cloud native work and their cloud native strategies potentially in a different way, in a different way to how they view their work now and how they view the design of the work right now. Specifically, these are the three things that we're going to be doing. I'm going to have a small section of, you know, what is. What is strategy? What is cloud native? And therefore, what is cloud native strategy? Because these words are either undefined or we all have a different meaning. So if my contribution to the conference is to help create a language that we can use to speak to each other, I'll be quite happy. Strategy is seeing. This is where we're going to look into a couple of uh, well-known stories. And we're going to see if we can pull any lessons from these stories and apply them to the work we do uh, uh, in Cloud Native. And then finally, we'll talk about discovering your own Cloud Native strategy. Okay, so these are the three questions. What is strategy? What is Cloud Native? And what is Cloud Native strategy? So, of course, in a talk about literature, the first thing we're going to talk about is Odysseus. So, I don't know, did anybody study the classics at university? That's good, because I more or less make this up. Uh, Wikipedia is your great friend when it comes to the classics. Um, OK, so most of you have probably heard the story of Odysseus. He set sail after the Battle of Troy, heading home to Ithaca, where his wife was waiting and his political enemies had been scheming. He killed the Cyclops, which was the son of Poseidon, and then in a fit of rage, Poseidon blew him off course. This began a number of trials and tribulations as he made his way through the Mediterranean all the way back to Ithaca, I think about 10 or 12 years later. So it was a long voyage. This particular image is about Odysseus's running with the sirens. The sirens were uh, uh, an enchantress, enchantresses, and what they did is they sang so beautifully, they would draw sailors towards them, where the sailors would, would become shipwrecked on the shore. Now, Odysseus, being a curious fellow, he'd wanted to listen to the sirens, but of course he didn't want to die. So he started to sort of come up with a plan, or if you like, a strategy. The strategy was simple enough. He got his crew to put wax cloth in their ears so they couldn't hear the singing for themselves. Then he instructed them to tie him to the mast. Presumably he gave that instruction before he put the wax in their ears. <laughs> Otherwise that would have been mutiny and certain death. Uh, and then, of course, they sailed past, he could listen to the sirens, and they sort of, uh, you know, went along their merry way. Now, the reason I tell this story is because within the story itself are the key elements of what strategy actually is. The most important thing to know, or one of the most important things to know, is strategy is embedded into a much larger narrative. So I used to think that strategy was about a romantic novel with a beginning, a complication, and an end. But after being a CEO for a few years, I realised that this shit never ends, right? So it's a lot more like Game of Thrones, uh, <laughs> episode to episode. So Odysseus, Odysseus's his journey was, was lots of sub-goals or proximate goals on the way to his final goal of landing in Ithaca. Importantly, very importantly, situational awareness. He understood not only his geographical location and the sirens, he understood his own capabilities and the capabilities and loyalty of his crew. Because seriously, what was in it for them? Right? Nothing. So they didn't get to listen to the sirens. It's about coalitions, and importantly, it's about self-supporting actions. So when Odysseus was fighting the Minotaur, and uh, sorry, when Odysseus was fighting the Cyclops, putting wax in his ears would not have been a good idea. Now you often see very advanced development teams, very advanced ops teams, but they can't work together. The actions are not self-supportive. That's key. To understand the final 
point of strategy, the final element of strategy, we can fast forward to post-war Sweden. So IKEA had a pretty decent goal, pretty good strategic aim, which was to provide low-cost furniture to the consumers of Sweden and presumably later Scandinavia. Unfortunately for them, they came upon an obstacle, just like Odysseus had. And the obstacle was that local designers and manufacturers didn't want to work with them because they were too cheap and they were, they were trying to lower the cost of the whole supply chain. Factories in Poland were willing to work with IKEA. And so what happened is that new opportunity, low cost manufacturing, led to the next problem. How do we get this stuff back? And that gave birth to the flat pack furniture that we know of today. This of course was never a strategic aim, right? This happened along the way. Fast forward to about the 1970s, and there's a change in the VAT legislation in Sweden. So what did the Swedes all do? They decided to spend all the savings on furniture. I mean, wouldn't we all? Um, but at that point, IKEA was a mail order company, and they couldn't, they couldn't, um, what's the word? They couldn't service the demand. So what they said was all of you Swedish people, you can drive to our depots with your Volvo station wagons, and you can take the flat pack furniture home. Swedish executives are obviously very conscientious because they were thought, oh my God, they'd come all the way from Sweden, they're going to be hungry, what can we feed them? Somebody said meatball and chips. <laughs> True story, right? And thus, in one moment, an obstacle had been changed into a business opportunity and thus the IKEA format that we know today, which serves meatballs and chips, where you pick up your furniture, was born. So what you actually see, what you actually get to, a more formal definition of strategy is this. You have your intentions. By the way, this is not mine. This is from Henry Mintzberg. He's a continuing, uh, a continues to inspire me with his books and his writing. Um, I would advise you know, people to look this up. So you have your intended strategy. What is it that we want to do? Sell you know, low-cost furniture or go cloud native or increase your time to value, whatever that may be. This becomes your deliberate strategy. Now, along the way, we get new ideas. The new ideas only become obvious with the passing of time. This is what we can think of as our emerging strategies. They form into our main body of action to create what, we, what is known as the realized strategy. This model is predicated on three things. The first thing is that there has to be some sort of intelligence. You have to have some notion of what's up ahead or what you want to achieve. That's where your intentions come from. But you need to keep an open mind because as time passes, new ideas will enter into your consciousness. And on top of that, you need good judgment. What should you drop and what should you integrate? What should you keep? Often, we get to this. This is where you plan the work and you work the plan. You get exactly what you aim for. Your intentions become your deliberate strategy. That's what you get. But due to your organizational constraints, you stop any emergence happening. This becomes known as a failed strategy. That feeling we have where we get what we want, but it's not quite enough. That's when you've not been learning. 100% emergence equals no control but 100% deliberate strategy equals no learning. You have to strike that balance. So that is my working definition, or my definition of strategy. This one is much, much easier. Everybody says to me, everybody's got their own definition of cloud native. Do, do people agree with that statement that there's like 100,000 definitions of cloud native? There's a man in the front here doing this, right? He's been watching too much world wrestling, right? Um, sorry, you'd only get that if you're American. Does anybody think that there's diversity within the community around the definition of cloud native? Well, at Container Solutions, we don't really think that's true because if you go to the website of the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, there's a section that actually explains what cloud native systems are. We more or less agree with that definition. So the definition is this, container package microservice oriented and continuously delivered. That's a cloud native system. The reason we build our systems like that is so we can take advantage of awesome tools like Kubernetes, which lets us automate our operations. That's it. That's what a cloud native system is. 
You can disagree with me if you like, but that's the, defin the definition that we use, and it's so far served us reasonably well. You got, got your picture, mate? Yeah. Uh, okay, so this brings us to cloud native strategy. It, it would be okay if you would think to yourself, well, actually, cloud native strategy must be the strategy whereby we bring in cloud native capabilities to our organization. That's not what we think of as cloud native strategy. Our definition is a bit longer than that. Our definition of cloud native strategy is actually how do you use cloud native computing to achieve your strategic aims? And so if we move on a slide, we realize that cloud native strategy for us at Container Solutions is simply shorthand for this. And if, oops, excuse me, it's clicker. And if you look at the cloud native hierarchy, this might give you some insights into um, what a cloud native strategy is. So at the top of the hierarchy, you see the euro sign. This is meant to denote value. Value for a startup might be market share and valuation. Uh, it also might be your time to reduce costs if you're a large enterprise so that you can later increase revenue. I don't think there's hardly any business strategies in the world that don't have value at the top and some mechanism to optimize the time to value. Are you all familiar with the expression TTV, time to value? Okay, only a few nods. So time to value is simply the time it takes from having an idea to putting it in front of a customer. So clearly if you have a new idea for a television, the time to value is measured in years. The time it takes to prototype, retool your factories, deliver it to a customer. In the world of software, uh, time to value can be reduced to an extremely short amount of time, especially if you think about all the infrastructure and tooling we have. So cloud native strategy is really about using microservices, containerized microservices, that have to be continuously deployed. If you manually build your monolith and it takes you an hour a day, you could probably live with that. But you can't build 10, 20, 15 microservices and spend an hour a day building and deploying each one. So continuous integration or an automated build system is non-negotiable in cloud native. And all of that is underpinned by, you know, as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. And what happens is value is created at every layer. So we, we save time and money by automating at the uh, infrastructure as a service layer, but we also save hardware costs, don't we? Because we now externalize that to the, uh, to the people who provide the clouds for us. At continuous integration level, we automate um, uh, the build process. And when we're building microservices, we're optimizing around speed and team size. So all of that value compounds to let companies achieve their strategic goals at the very top. So this is a little bit long-winded, but basically, this is the definition that we've got for cloud native strategy. If your path to value relies on infrastructure as a service, microservices and continuous delivery, then this is our shorthand to say you're using cloud native computing to achieve your strategies. I can see people taking a photograph of that. I don't know if I stole that or wrote it myself. Uh, I really don't. So if that appears on the internet on somebody else's website, do let me know and I'll put a link at the bottom. Uh, I was a bit pressed for time uh, preparing these slides. Um, so, this, now we get to the meat of our story. What lessons can we learn from literature? So the first story we're going to look at, some of you might remember from your childhood, um, because there's a particularly nasty pair of villains, uh, carnivorous, uh, vengeful, uh, bitter people, Mr. and Mrs. McGregor from Peter Rabbit. So the first story is Peter Rabbit. So what does Peter do? He wakes up in the morning with his three brothers, Mopsy, Topsy, anybody know the other one was called? Cottontail, very good, this guy here. Uh, Cottontail, yeah. And so the story starts with a fatal attraction, like all good stories, right? It's the same with Odysseus and the sirens. You know, don't go near the sirens. So what does he do? Go near the sirens. His mother gives him express instructions do not go to Mr. McGregor's garden. So what does he do? He goes straight to Mr. McGregor's garden. This thus begins the dream stage of the story. He discovers an almost unlimited supply of radishes, cabbages, onions, and beets. 
and he gorges himself on these vegetables. Unfortunately, he starts to feel a little bit sick. A bit like when Amazon sends you their first bill. <laughs> You've gorged yourself on a seemingly unlimited amount of compute resource. And just when he couldn't feel any worse, he turns around the corner and comes face to face with his arch enemy, Mr. McGregor. Thus begins a hot pursuit through the vegetable gardens, around the back gate which was locked, and finally, when he's completely exhausted, Peter gets caught in a net and he gives himself up for dead. Three very friendly sparrows come and they encourage him. Don't give up, Peter. There's a way out of this. He uses his last amount of energy to escape the net and continues his frantic and desperate pursuit of freedom. He finds himself, and I quote, being lippity loppity, very tired. For the second time in the book, gives himself up for dead until out the corner of his eye, he sees a wheelbarrow. And from this elevated position, Peter is able to not only for the first time ascertain his goal, but he's able to quickly execute it. So he goes from strategy formulation to strategy execution almost instantaneously. He goes home, collapses into bed, and promises his mother never to go to Mr. McGregor's house or garden ever again. So the strategic lessons of Peter Rabbit are like this. His search for his strategy is both random and frantic. I don't know if anybody relates to such a frantic and random search. If you've ever began a startup, you might recognize some of that. Uh, he doesn't really have a strategy. He's desperately seeking an exit and trying to avoid death. The story, like many stories, is really a story of continued uh, maturation. He's maturing through each obstacle that he faces. And because, just as the story with Ikea, it happens over time, knowledge and lessons compound over time. The elevated position he takes on the wheelbarrow is a metaphor for being able to, for the first time, see the whole situation. So often in stories, you see people, people's physical position change from a low point to a high point, and that signifies the final step into adulthood. This is when Peter can finally make his escape. Just returning to Odysseus for a moment, Odysseus ended up on having, I think, 12 adventures. He returned to Ithaca, and the first thing he did was disguise himself as a beggar. And what he was doing was taking stock of the situation. Nobody knew he was there. He was able to survey his en enemies, find out where his family was. For the first time in his adult life, Odysseus could see whole. He could see the whole picture. The book ends very quickly. He unmasks himself and very rapidly vanquishes his enemies and reclaims his kingdom. So Odysseus, just like Peter Rabbit, is a story about a trial by fire until the final maturation is met and then the goal is achieved almost instantaneously. This is what we mean by strategy of seeing. Many startups don't succeed. Many, like Peter's father, end up in a rabbit pie. That was the fate of Peter's father. So you could see he was a bit crazy, almost suicidal, to go to a place where his dad got eaten. Um, so the next story, which is much, much more interesting for us in the world of cloud native and technology, is the story of Theseus. Does anybody know this one? No? OK, that's good. So all the mistakes I make will remain unknown. Uh, Theseus um, lived in Athens. He was Greek and Athenian. And what had happened is King Minos had waged a campaign in that part of the world, and he'd won, but he'd lost his son. So what began was a period of tyranny. And every seven years, the Athenians were meant to deliver to Minos seven maidens and seven of the youngest, bravest warriors, where they would be put into the labyrinth on Crete, only to be devoured by the Minotaur. This was the context which Theseus was, was, was brought up in. When he came of age, he begged his father to let him go on the next boat uh, to Crete, where he would try his best to vanquish the Minotaur and lift Athens from the tyranny. He put a black sail on the ship and promised his father upon his return he would change the sail to be white 
and therefore his dad would know that he was safe. They didn't have WhatsApp in ancient Greece. So off he went, uh, oops, excuse me, off he went, and as soon as he landed on Crete, he met Minos' daughter, Ariadne. Ariadne and Theseus fell immediately in love, and she provided him with two pieces of technology. The first one was a sword, which he could use to kill the Minotaur, and the second one was thread, which he could use to leave behind him as he entered the labyrinth and then later exit. That's the Minotaur there. That's the labyrinth. Oh, excuse me, I'm not going to go to that. There's another part of this story. What he does, following the instructions that Ariadne gave him, which were delivered to her by Daedalus, who had created the labyrinth, is he's able to enter the labyrinth, defeat the beast, only to escape later with the seven youngsters, and the seven young men, and the six, excuse me, the six young men and the seven uh, girls that he went with, but he also takes with him Ariadne and her sister Theadra. The story gets complicated because the goddess Athena intervenes and she tells Theseus, you have to leave, you have to leave um, Ariadne on, Nax on Naxus. They were very much in love and he owed her a debt of gratitude for providing the technology. Athena offers no explanation for this. She just says you've got to leave her there. Upon his journey home, he's so distressed, he forgets to change the sail. His father, King Aegeus, throws himself off the cliffs into the Aegean Sea, the sea that still has its name today, uh, thus committing suicide and bringing the whole episode to an end. So the strategic lessons from the story of Theseus are very interesting. So first of all, the dark shadow is cast by King Minos. Very often in storytelling, the king, the monarch, or the ruler of the empire begins as a, as a force of life, as a force of good. But as the monarch ages, they mutate from being a life-giving force to becoming a dark tyrant. This is essentially what King Minos has cast over the whole of the empire, right? Theseus, just like Peter Rabbit, can only begin his escape once he can see the whole situation. In this case, aided by the thread that Ariadne had given to him. Theseus is, uh, is better than Peter Rabbit. Peter Rabbit gives up. He never actually goes back to that garden. He never changed the status quo. He never changed the power structure. All he did was put his toe in the, in the, in the sort of pool of the garden and then quickly exited. The labyrinth in, in the story of Theseus represents the order that all humans want to put on the world. When that order's working, when that bureaucracy's working, it serves a life-giving purpose. It's when the bureaucracy fails to start working that it becomes a problem. I love the story because it points out very clearly the problem we all face. We can all slay the Minotaur on our laptop in the context of our living rooms or our offices. It's very hard to slay the cloud-native Minotaur in the face of the bureaucracy that you're trying to succeed within. So what sets Theseus apart is he doesn't just succeed in his mission, but he does so in the context of a bureaucracy that is quite literally composed of dead ends. And just like our enterprises chew up and spit out generations of engineers, so, does, so too does the labyrinth and the Minotaur. Uh, there are many of us working in cloud native computing because we want to put an end to this madness, right? Never send, it's the matrix principle, never send a human to do a machine's job. And yet, that's what we do. And we're just chewing up wave after wave after wave of engineers on configuration and you know, running TIBCO. Uh, this madness has got to stop. Um, those three much, much, much more interesting and more subtler lessons of Theseus. So King Aegeus jumping into the sea represents the end of the existing order. Um, it's almost impossible for the next generation of engineers, scientists, doctors, you name it, to usher in their way, way of doing things while the old guard hangs on to everything. The companies that we've seen who have succeeded with DevOps or cloud native computing or anything sort of new worldy does so with new managers and new leadership teams. Anything that you learn on an MBA in the 1990s is not going to inform you of how to go cloud native 
or how to increase your time to value using cloud native systems. So the king has to die. This is a question I always get. Does there have to be blood? Do, do people have to be fired? And, and I'm like, no, you can run your organizations profitably you know, by working two days a week and playing ping pong for the other three days. Uh, yes, there often has to be blood, and it's for these reasons. It's a strategy test. Does the change you're trying to instigate transcend organizational boundaries? Does the change you're trying to instigate require capabilities that the organization doesn't have? And does the change create winners and losers and therefore resistance? If you can answer yes to all of those questions, then you're going to need a strategy. And if you've got a strategy, there will be blood. That is a fact. The key, the key paradox of strategy that nobody likes to talk about is what's good for the enterprise or the organization is often not good for the individuals in it. And that's why when you come up with a strategy, you need a strategy for dealing with resistance. Look on the interweb for ING and how they did their DevOps journey. Uh, and you'll see some interesting stories about how they dealt with this. The second subtle lesson of, um, of Theseus and cloud native stuff, it's the abandonment of Ariadne. So she's done nothing wrong, and yet she's left on an island on her own. Later she gets rescued by these people, but nonetheless she's no longer together with Theseus. Peter Rabbit teaches us a childish lesson. Listen to your mama. The, the ancient Greeks teach us something much more brutal. Strategy is always executed and formulated in groups, but individuals mature at different rates than others. By definition, your coalitions are temporal. Anybody who doesn't speak to their ex-business partner or ex-wife knows what I'm talking about, or ex-husband for that matter. So at one moment, you're good for each other, but at a certain point, you're not. That's the cold reality that Theseus has to face. And that points to another reality, is that success, by definition, will always be tainted by grief. Something has to move out the way for something new to come in. And that's the brutal lesson of the loss of that early love. And then the final, sorry about the, this, the final subtle uh, point of Theseus is the technology. I spent the last 20 years saying to people, the technology is incidental, right? It doesn't matter what tech you've got because that's not how we're gonna win this fight. We're gonna produce good applications when we're speaking to users and when we're speaking to each other. The technology is incidental. Mainly, it's still incidental, right? A bad team with the best tools in the world will still get nowhere. But in this story, the thread is not incidental. It's actually the enabling technology that allows Theseus to see whole. And in the world of cloud native, the technology is also not incidental. We couldn't have gone cloud native 20 years ago. So actually, the technology is a key driving force in helping us to succeed with what we're working on now. So for once, technology really is half the story. Just half. No more. Not, all, not the whole story. So, as we sort of come to the end of this talk then, this is the thing I want to focus on, seeing Hull. Um, what we've been doing recently with different customers and collaborators is working to create a map uh, for them or with them of their own organisations. So, this was just an example. This was done for one specific customer and it's now been anonymised. For your organisations, your map might look very different. Many, many companies come to us and they say they want 15 of Container Solutions' best engineers. Now that sounds a bit like when King Minos asked for 14 of the best virgins, right? Uh, and they think that they need 15 engineers because they've got this idea that their cloud native problems will be fixed by brute strength alone. We know that's not the case. We try to get people to slow down and try to actually diagnose what is the problem they're trying to fix. Because if you don't have a problem diagnosis, it's impossible to compare strategies. Which one is a good strategy? Which one is a bad strategy? So I do come across lots of strategies. Lots of executives has, ask me to check their strategies. And then I say, what problem are you fixing? And they can't answer the question. So then I don't look at the strategy, because there's no point. 
Try to map out your own organisations. Try to see whole. But remember the notion of a journey. Some things, need to be, some things need to be done first and something needs to be done second. And so actually what we end up doing is you might start in one area of the map, move to another, fix your front end, and then realise once you're in production you need 24-7 support. I wouldn't advise people to do everything at once. Small teams are better than big teams, and small teams going slow are better than, well, to just, that's the best thing to do, is just have a, a small setup where people are actually thinking about what they're doing. When you nail your problem definition and solution in one area, try it again, nail it again. Nail, 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 scale. Premature scaling of a cloud native strategy or any strategy is the sort of classic, classic mistake. So you should try to draw this for your own organizations. So then wrapping up then, um, cloud native strategy is shorthand for something else. It's basically short for using cloud native technologies to achieve your business aims, whatever they may be. They can range from fixing your enterprise, but it can also be used, cloud native technologies can also be used to quickly start a startup because you've got access to all this compute resource. But remember the lesson of Peter. Um, stories of discovery don't really help us. I'm sort of sick of stories of journeys. We need to talk about stories of struggles and stories of obstacles and stories of difficult choices because they'll inform us better on our journey. Um, the CEO is one of the only people in any organisation who can see whole because it's his or her job to do so. Without executive support for Cloud Native, you've got no chance. You've got absolutely no chance. If you've done a bottom-up Cloud Native a sort of transformation, I'd really, really like to hear about it. Um, technology is not incidental. You're very likely to need a map. Once you've mapped your landscape, the jump from strategy formulation to execution is almost instant. We've worked with a lot of companies that sort of went around the garden for a couple of years and all of a sudden it became clear what they needed to do. And what we've started to see is that this stuff goes slow and then it goes fast. So you must continue your search, uh, you must continue to uncover your own map so you can start to identify your own goals. Thank you. I'll take questions, of course. Yeah, hey. I wanted a screenshot of the big blood that. You want a screenshot of? And there will be blood. Strategy test. Okay. Anybody else? Any more questions or photo opportunities? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the slides will be available somewhere. Carl, the CNCF will fix it. If, if you tweet me at Jamie Dobson, I can get it to you for sure. Yes, Gareth, are you? Uh, you said this technology uh, isn't incidental, but your map actually was, apart from containers, probably mainly capabilities, sort of like things that need some technology to accomplish, but are the technologies themselves. Is it really the process? So the question is, I said technology is not incidental and then Gareth said if you look at my map, uh, actually there was a lot more process and capabilities on there and less uh, sort of mention of technology. And the question was are the processes the things that are really not incidental? I would say yes, the processes are completely uh, uh, really crucial, as is the skills of your strategist and this ability to see whole. Um, but I think of cloud native as a little bit like a, a car native strategy. Without roads and factories, it doesn't make any sense. So maybe they're not completely on an equal footing with the creative process, but they are extremely important into the work we're doing. It's the aggregate of those technologies, not the specific So, specific technologies, I could not give a fuck about. They're absolutely irrelevant. So, Docker versus Rocket, Kubernetes versus DCOS. Uh, if you can't orchestrate containers in, with one, you won't be able to orchestrate them with the other. That choice is incidental. And all my different colleagues from my diff the different companies we work with will scream at me later. Because they all want me to say their thing's the best. Yeah. So, the question is, 
Yeah. So the question was, which of the Mintzberg's books would I recommend? So the classic about strategic planning is very dense. So if you're a proper strategy geek, you should read that. But a very good introduction is Strategy Safari, which covers 10 different types of strategy, and it's like a safari through the wilderness. And that's really cool. So it covers all the five force analysis shit that Michael Porter did, uh, and why you shouldn't use it. Any more? Yes? So at the end there, you mentioned that uh, stories of discovery are no longer interesting. You know, stories of stories of discovery. Yeah. Is that something that you would benefit more from stories of struggle at this point than stories of discovery? Oh, yeah, okay. So for the benefit of the video, the, the, the gentleman asked, he said that I said journey, stories of journeys are not, not interesting. I actually said not useful. And should we as a community talk more about our struggles? Uh, yes, I think the answer to that question is yes. I personally grow hugely tired of people looking for shortcuts. It's, that's in the business literature. I, I don't criticize the communities we employ because a lot of us do have difficult conversations, usually over beers, right? And many of us are attacking this from many different angles. But I think there's a tension between vendors who want to shift products. Hey, buy our licenses for a thousand nodes. It'll all work. I, of course, they're trying to sell licenses. But what they're doing is creating an illusion that this stuff's actually reasonably straightforward when it's not. Now, I consider that dishonest, but they're allowed to do what they like with their businesses. That makes my job, because primarily, I see myself as an engineer, somebody who balances constraints, takes difficult decisions, and builds coalitions. That's how you succeed with all businesses. That's, I think, what we should focus on. But typically, nobody else wants to talk about that. Yeah. So it's tough to get talks like this accepted. Yes, as I said, people usually take pity on me and shove me in a small room. <laughs> Unless you get the keynote, and then they let you do shit like this. Uh, yeah. You're welcome. Any more? Hey, thank you so much for listening. Uh, this was all new, and I was actually super nervous. So thanks for listening and, and all coming.